Oh, sorry, I didn't see you there. Just just keeping up to date with the latest Chelsea trends. This is my rational perspective. I'm Daniel Childs on Chelsea 1, Fulham 0. Chelsea have now made it three wins in a row in the Premier League. I believe that's four Premier League wins at home at Stamford Bridge since July of 2020, the lockdown or post-lockdown period, the Pulisic period as we call it. Uh, under Frank Lampard, that in itself is is something to be happy about, a sense of progression, even if it's not severe progression. It, it, it's decent. And it in the end was a big win. You could see how much it meant to the players. I think responding from the midweek disappointment and embarrassment at Middlesbrough and that bounce back ability, if we want to call it, is an important trait to have. Something that last season's team didn't have in abundance. And... With individual performances that we can highlight, and I'm going to do this with an opinion that I think I've got wrong in my instant reaction that some of you pointed out when I put up my poll for Man in the Match. You know, I don't know why people have to just be so unrelentingly negative all the time about Chelsea. There is a time and place, as we do quite regularly on the show, as we have in recent uh, days as well, to talk about constructive criticisms, to talk about the structure of the club. These, these these are all things that I think are absolutely relevant and appropriate to talk about. I'm not. I I would never tell someone to be a blind propagandist for the club and to put on glasses that just make you feel that everything's perfect and everything's happy. But I don't know. To me, like I'm a football supporter, I have to have some form of hope to make this thing enjoyable. And when Chelsea win games it makes my weekends. I'm sure it's the same for a lot of you. And it just seems to me, especially in the online sphere, that people go so extreme one way before a game has even taken place that maybe they feel a bit of shame if they come out and actually be a little bit positive about their football club winning. It's strange times we're in 2024 and when we've seen it for a very long time. So me praising what I'm about to praise and feeling upbeat and positive is, is not me saying that everything's perfect at Chelsea, that things are as great as they ever have been at Chelsea, that there aren't fundamental problems still at the club, that there aren't things that we will see and criticise in, in weeks to come. Of course, but when Chelsea win a game, I'm a Chelsea channel, I'm going to be positive about that, surely. So please do give me your man of the match and your thoughts in the comments below, as always. I thought the team selection was a little bit underwhelming, I have to say, uh, especially not seeing Noni Manawake, who I know didn't have an amazing game against Middles Middlesbrough. No one did. But, you know, to see Raheem Sterling, who, yes, in the end, contributes in quite a big way, a defining way in today's game, um, I thought was just, yeah, it was frustrating to me. And I wasn't too shocked that Chilwell, Chukameka and Badia Shield didn't take take a place in a starting eleven. They've just returned from, from injuries, especially in the case of Chilwell and Chukameka. They've been out for a while. And we saw both of them later in the game. But then it was just that concern of, are we going to see a similar tale? And I felt there were moments in that first half where Chelsea looked like they could have burst into a bit of life. It did look to me like a 4 triple 2 where you had uh, Gallagher very much pushing up with Armando Breuer. And I was encouraged by Levi Colwell. There's going to be a lot of praise for Levi, I think rightly so. Because I thought Levi's movement today, ironically against Fulham, maybe he just needs to play against Fulham to play like a proper left back, is he was making those overlapping runs. He was trying to burst forward. I like to see that from him. I thought Enzo Fernandez played some good balls over the top. Chelsea were trying to mix things up at times. Um, and there were moments in, you know, especially from Cole Palmer. And again, this led to, this was a trend we saw early on that led to the defining moment of the game that wins Chelsea the points where some very slick and fast passing when Chelsea did quicken things up inside the six-yard box or around the box. But unfortunately, it did kind of turn into the classic low block game where Chelsea are kind of sluggishly passing it back and forth. I know Pochettino got very angry with specifically Conor Gallagher, who did today have a real tendency to go backwards. I didn't like to see that from Conor. I think he, he can be a lot more of a progressive player. He needs to be a driving force in this team like he has been for a lot of this season. And unfortunately, he wasn't today, uh, even though he did nearly score in the second half. It just felt like we were very much going into a a classic Chelsea struggling to find ideas to break a team with, with with a low block down. In the case of attacking for Fulham and dangers, yes, the save from P Petrovic in the first half, I think from Wilson, is, is absolutely brilliant. And Petrovic deserves some flowers today. He really does. Uh, because if that goal goes in, it, of course, it becomes a, a massive uphill task. And I think the, the mood around the club wasn't that great before today. And a 12.30 kickoff, as we saw earlier in the season against Brentford, can be a very sluggish affair. And... and as I say, up until half-time, there wasn't a lot to speak about in the game. 
but it comes from an individual moment of of brilliance from Cole Palmer, as it has been for most of this season. A game changer, that bit of individual spark and, and invention that Chelsea haven't had from many players in recent years. And it, it was, you know, quick feet by Raheem Sterling. I think he has had a tendency to try and win penalties too frequently to a point where he isn't going to get any because he keeps throwing himself at the ground. This was one where... It was a clear foul. It was a penalty. I do want to point this out quickly before I forget. Yes, Malo Gusto probably should have been sent off for a challenge on Willian. But it's the classic PG MOL inconsistency, right? We had Anthony Taylor, the head of incompetency um, in the centre today. And it's the classic VAR thing of uh, Gusto got a red card for something like that earlier in the season. He doesn't get a red card today. We see a consistent inconsistency from the Premier League officials and... I've always said on this show, whether it benefits Chelsea or it doesn't, bad officiating is bad officiating. And I think if you're a Fulham fan, if you're Marco Silva, if, especially if you're Willian, you probably are sitting there and going, it should be a red card. And that absolutely could have changed the game in, in Fulham's favour. But it didn't. Chelsea got away with it. Gusto got away from, get, got away from it. And uh, we get the penalty. And as I say, a massive moment in the game that swings in Chelsea's favour. The complexion of that game radically changes. Cole Palmer... So much confidence, a bit like he's getting like Eddie Hazard, you know, so much confidence when he steps up to take a penalty, he's going to finish it. And he absolutely did with so much confidence and ease. Another goal for him from the spot and Chelsea going to the break 1-0 up and, and now have a moment that completely changes the game. I, I spoke about this in the preview that when you come up against a team like Fulham, who sure they did have a couple of chances throughout the game that Petrovic was, was able to save, but really I thought their the quality of their long balls today really helped Chelsea because it stopped them countering their lack of clear decision making at times in the second half too when they were trying to break on Chelsea to create some opportunities was was really helpful too. Uh, there was a moment in the second half where Raul Jimenez just literally tried to score from the halfway line and it completely breaks down any dangerous move when it looked like Silva could have been exploited. So I thought from an attacking point of view today, Fulham were really poor on the ball and it kind of shows you that when you do have that strategy of trying to hit direct, if that quality isn't there, it can very easily break down. Just as the same as Chelsea fans get frustrated by it, is the tippy tappy, you know, passing it around from the back. If that thing isn't fast enough, if the quality, once you get into the final third and that decision making, once you break past the press isn't good enough, that's going to hit you as well. And it, and it has at times for Chelsea. Um, in the second half, Chelsea did have chances to make it 2-0 or make the game more comfortable. You know, Sterling hit the post. I think he should have done better there. He probably would have been onside. Conor Gallagher um, hitting that post late on with that inside of the foot. Um, or oh, sorry, was it outside of the foot? His right foot actually that hit the post. It would have been a wonderful finish of, of execution. And he still hasn't scored this season. So it would have, would have been a massive moment. Gallagher needs to find a back of the net soon because his performances actually have been tailing off in recent weeks. Uh, so, so it could have become more dangerous. But I do want to point out some of the key players I think we have to today and that is firstly I'm talking about Levi Colwell because my breakdown show on Thursday talked about Levi at left back now I don't think that again that analysis is completely irrelevant and we were stupid for bringing up that analysis because I think it's something that a lot of Chelsea fans have been speaking about but today we not only saw a Levi that defensively was up a higher level I thought offensively too he was in the sort of areas that you'd want him to be as a left back and very much offering that that cover and that space and, and also an, an option to overlap at times. I think he was being, his end product isn't as good because he's not a natural left back, but I, I like to see it because it offers us extra threat going forward. And it was able at times, there was a point where he's literally on the byline trying to get forward. It seemed like he was a lot more daring. Um, and it, and it asked, I said this as well, it asks a question of the opposition. The opposition, if they've got Levi running beyond the ball, trying to make that run like a, a Ben Chirwell would, you've got to try and counteract it. You can't just allow him to make that run because you could end up conceding a goal because of it or, or leaving a man free inside the box. So so I thought that helped. But if you just look at some of his numbers, 95 touches, 75% pass accuracy, 41 of 55 passes completed, 10 ball recoveries, eight of his ground draws won, six of six tackles won, six clearances, three interceptions, three long balls completed and two dribbles completed. It was a really emphatic game and I, and I don't think people are being silly when they point out that this was his best game for Chelsea. I think it was his most complete game for Chelsea and hopefully now Ben Chiro is back, we can see him move a little bit more central. Another player that I want to give some flowers to, I said Petrovic, feels a bit like to me, a, like a Mendy regen in a sense where 
It looks like we've invested good money on a young goalkeeper and he just does the basics very well. You know, he doesn't look like he has a, a lapse of concentration within him, which we saw consistently with Sanchez earlier in the season. From corners, from set pieces, he's quite commanding. That height very much is helping Chelsea in that aspect. And he made some key saves, game-changing saves. The in the first half, in the second half too, when Chelsea could have conceded an equaliser there and the game could have turned in another direction. We've got to give some credit to Petrovic. And I think people who bought Petrovic stocks earlier in the season, I've got to give a lot of respect to them because he has now firmly cemented himself as first choice. And what you see with the loan player we've got out at Madrid, who's been able to fail upward somehow, I think you, you get a clear contrast between the competency of Petrovic and the incompetency of some other players who've been in that role before and how much of a difference it makes in tight games like today. Uh, another player, Moises Casado. I, I saw tweets about this as well. It's like, I think at this point, it's quite clear you're not really watching Chelsea games properly if you're you're not giving some credit to Moises Casado. And it's, it's dirty kind of un flattering or at times just things that are not that flamboyant they aren't going to be shown in a comp that people are going to share on twitter constantly he's just doing very basic but very effective central defensive midfielder things that this chelsea team has lacked inside the box making key challenges uh covering space covering the space of others sensing danger being able to stop that danger and at times being able to try and keep attacks or start attacks himself which we did see another part of his game at Brighton that we haven't seen as much at Chelsea so I, I want to give some credit to Moises Casado because listen the fee was insane and that's what it is and it's a bit like Enzo Fernandez, right the, the fee looms over these players because it is just absolutely insanity but what I wanted from Moises Casado, I'm seeing him give that to Chelsea right now and I think today was a prime example of maybe if you didn't have that profile of play in that central midfield Chelsea could have been exp exploited in key moments in that second half especially on transition and listen I was wrong about Enzo Fernandez. Um, I wasn't that impressed when I got out the ground but looking back at some of his numbers looking back at some of the footage I thought from a passing point of view and we'll look at his numbers here I know that I believe they gave him man of the match 93 touches 82% pass accuracy 50 of 61 passes completed nine ground draws one five out of long five out of eight sorry long balls completed four out of six dribbles completed three tackles one three key passes and one big chance created I feel like today we saw a a clear example that Enzo is playing more of a suitable role for him. He is playing alongside Moises Casado. He's not playing further up the pitch. My frustration, I think the reason I came to that conclusion was firstly, I still think Enzo gives away. It's, it's, it's just a little bit weird with Enzo because he can play that dazzling ball over the top that's very hard for a lot of players to execute and he can execute it to perfection. And he has the skill, he has the sense that the ball is sticking to his feet. That's not my problem with him. He's clearly a wildly talented footballer that I think will get better for Chelsea. It's the six-yard pass where he cheaply gives it away to the opposition. And there was a time in the second half where he you know, cost Chelsea, potentially cost Chelsea on transition and gave Fulham the chance to to be dangerous and, and go at us in, in our own half. It's those things that I'd like sharpening up and do frustrate me because they have cost Chelsea this season. So... It's just that side of it. And I don't think I'm being unfair there. If I if I had an agenda against Enzo, I wouldn't bring those numbers up. I'd, be, I'd sat here with the same opinion about Enzo Fernandez and I wouldn't have looked at it. But on this show, I want to be fair. I want to be constructive and give Enzo Fernandez credit because I think those numbers do show an influential player and hopefully him and Casado will continue to grow as a midfield partnership, which is what we hoped at the start of the season. I also think Thiago Silva um, was brilliant today. I thought from a, a physically imposing... There were times, especially in the second half, where he really was trying to move Chelsea forward. And the fact that at times, a lot of the time, he's coming up against players who could exploit him in transition. Just think, it, again, it, it's that... We have spoke about it for years and years with Silva. It's that classic Silva mature performance where there's a bit of elegance. There's that leadership. There's just know how to make smart decisions. Um, even take a yellow, yellow when you need to. All of those things, I think, made Thiago a, a standout player for me today. I feel like a criticism of Poch as the game is going on was about subs. Now, I understand why Chilwell coming on, wonderful to see that Chilwell went left wing. Now, I understand from game management, which we've criticised about this Chelsea team, that it shored up the game. Chilwell, actually, if you look at his individual performance, was really good, like really composed. And given this is a guy who hasn't kicked a ball since September, that in itself is a big plus and shows you the quality of Ben Chilwell, which I've always promoted on this show. I think he is my favourite player within the current squad and, and it was wonderful to see. I feel that with 
just that i just don't want to see it moving forward and listen i know mudrick is a maverick i know mudrick is erratic as a as a talent i absolutely concede that i just felt that there were times in that second half when chelsea were able to break against a fulham team that were pressing up and i just thought enzo suddenly was in areas where he probably shouldn't be and i'd rather a faster player there so that was my only frustration is maybe we could have exploited fulham a little bit more but Alfie Gilchrist comes on and does the... I, I saw someone tweet to me, I think it was Alfie on, on, on X, say he's kind of like the reverse Solskjaer. You know, Gilchrist comes on and just his, his job is literally just to boot the ball as far away from danger as possible and the crowd loves it and, and we did love it a lot. Uh, Chukameka came on, just wonderful to see him get a cameo. And uh, Madawake too, I, I, I think he's... I still think he should be in the first team more regularly because um, I think he, he's working really hard for the team. I, I think in terms of pressing from the front, I think he offers a lot of things that Pochettino would like about a player. So hopefully he'll get more minutes in the upcoming weeks. Now, there was some uh, outrage classic with, with Chelsea, of course, for every game around this Argyle film promotion. And listen, I understand it looked silly. It looked absurd. I didn't understand doing it inside the ground. And I think it's just a classic tone deaf promotional thing from a club maybe not understanding the current climate of their fan base at the moment, is that people don't really want to see that type of stuff. What I will say, though, is that commercialism and film promotions around football are nothing new. I mean, they really aren't. I, I just think that, sure, I know some journalists have, have given have basically given their whole match reports talking about a film promotion rather than the actual game. And it's like, really? Like, I understand the, the frustration and, and we spoke about this before and I spoke about this when I was reacting to that kit leak that a lot of this is made kind of for not the average match going supporter. And I think you have to accept that. But that's a widespread football problem. That's not just a Chelsea problem. Now, if you want to use it as ammunition for an argument that the club doesn't get what it's doing, fair enough. I understand why people come to that conclusion. But like it felt, it feels like to me, people have just jumped on that for their thing to be negative about today when actually... Did it impact the game in the end? I've spent most of my review talking about the important stuff, which is player performances, which is the tactics of Chelsea, which is how we won the game, what we did well, what we didn't do well, all of that stuff. And I think Pochettino said as much after. It, it's just what football is. Now, I, I think there is an absurd thing and maybe Chelsea went over that line with that promotion today. But I, I mean, it, it, listen, is, is it the end of the world? Uh, is anyone going to think about it a week later? Probably not, right? And I think when we actually talk about the real issues at Chelsea right now, I think there are more fundamental ones we could be spending time about. And listen, I'm a little bit biased because Matthew Vaughan's my favourite director and I'm going to be going to see that film. But listen, I, I think there is a limit to it. Maybe Chelsea went overboard. But is it the thing to lose your head about today when Chelsea have actually won a game of football? Third in a row in the Premier League, up to eighth, we're going to get a nosebleed. Maybe some European football next season. Is it the end of the world? It probably isn't. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this show. If you're a Chelsea fan and you want more carefree content, please do hit that subscribe button. Really helps the channel out as well as the like button and sharing it around with friends so more people can get involved in the community. And you can follow Son of Chelsea across socials at Son of Chelsea on TikTok, on Instagram and on X. Thank you.